Welcome to the Libertarian Corner Point. I'm Richard Fields, and on the program today we have Edwin Edberry, who is the uh, the founder of the I Am Happy Project, as well as the Happy Neighborhood Project. You got to spread it around, right? Yes. Uh, we have John Cameron, who is uh, Liberty Society Manager at Pacific Legal Foundation, and Jason McPhee, who is a uh, engineer and engineer at the uh, at the California in, in, in the state of California. So, uh, welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, the, uh, let's see, what are we doing first here? We're doing, uh, yeah, 14th first, right, okay. Uh, we're doing uh, uh, a, uh, an expose on happiness on the 14th uh, or the 20th of, uh, of, of March, yes. so International Day of Happiness. Did you start that? No, I did not start that, but we did contribute to it. You know, good, the, good. the United Nations actually passed a resolution in 212 making March 20th, the International Day of Happiness. And so since 2013, it's been celebrated, and we have been making sure that people are aware of it in the Northern California and throughout the, the country. So uh, March 20th, the theme for this year is share happiness. And so we're gonna go around the street of Sacramento just asking people how they share happiness. And hopefully we can remind one or two people why we are around here. Well, your smile would make anybody happy, right? <laughs> That is so generous. And you, you have this uh, card that you just handed me, which yes. I thought was interested, which is the 10 ways to be happy. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, give us the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, give, it, give us the, the secret to happiness in a nutshell. Well, I don't know if there's a secret, uh, and that's the good part, because, you know, we're always looking for secret stuff, but yeah. there is really none, and, yeah. and that's the good part. Uh, the one thing that, that I do focus on when people say, hey, you're the chief happiness officer, make me happy. So first of all, I say I can't do that because if I can, it'd be a different word. But I really look, after interviewing over a thousand so people on the subject, I think one of the things anybody can do very quickly to raise their level of happiness is gratitude. And, uh, and I feel like gratitude is something we take for granted. In short, we just released a new app called the Happy Neighborhood, and the first thing people see on it is gratitude. It, it just help you, you know, just list down some of the things you are thankful for. Now, the, 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 the strange thing about gratitude is people are looking for the big stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't win lottery yet, so they yeah. have no reason to be thankful, you know? Yeah. They have not got that major promotion yet, so they don't need to be thankful. We did an uh, event this weekend at the Carl Expo, and a, a guy gave me one of the most terrific reasons to be happy. I was passing out the 10 ways, and he goes, oh, waking up in the morning, that's a good reason. <laughs> and I said, what if more people just acknowledge that, that waking up is a good reason to be thankful? I think that would be a good beginning. So gratitude by far, as a matter of fact, I think it was Harvard Medical School, they did a study that if people just take the time and just write down what they are thankful for once a day for six months, they will raise the level of happiness by 10%. I once did a workshop where I uh, asked people to uh, pull out, you know, they didn't know they are gonna have to do it. I asked them to pull out their cell phone and think of somebody who they, they were grateful to. Yes. Call that person up and say why they were grateful. Yes. They, and so I said, okay, come back in 10 minutes after you've made your phone call. Wow. And they came back and I said, how do you feel? Yes. They will be in heaven, <laughs> for real. They, and that's the thing with happiness. It, uh, Thomas Edison said, that happiness is like perfume. You know, you can't spray it on other people without a few drops coming out. <laughs> so they thought that calling that person would be wonderful, but it does more magic on them. And so uh, if you were to say, you know, give, give people, uh, other than gratitude, and okay. I agree, gratitude is probably number one. Yeah. What's, what's one or two and three? I think the number two would be service to others. Okay. Yeah, we are caught into our day-to-day -day routine. We are so busy, you know, I say sometimes we're busy doing nothing, but we are so busy. We don't have time to serve other people. So if we just take time, maybe one hour a month, you know, you know as a start and be of service to other people, you see the impact that they have on you as an individual, and of course we know the impact it has on the receiver. So I think being of service, doing some volunteer work, it's super, super necessary. And if you look at gratitude and volunteering, these are things anybody can do. Sure. Without, you don't have to be rich or poor, you don't have to have a whole lot of time because you know, we all have the same amount of time. So gratitude would definitely be it. And I think the third, and this is one that's kind of tricky, 
It's just being, again, acknowledging that you have all that you need to live a good life. <laughs> Not wanting more. No. <laughs> Banishing envy. You know, you know, for it. You know, you really do. Now, it's okay to have big goals and dream. I think we're going to talk about Jeff Bezos sending people to the moon and all those kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong about having big goals. But don't let that goal determine your level of happiness. In the here and now. Yeah, because you already have what it takes to be totally happy. If you never get a team more, you can be totally happy and you'll be okay. I have a saying that goes something like this. You do not allow the past or the future to rob you of the present. And yet, we waste so much time on what has happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future that the present just vanish. We so don't even notice like you it. Sounds like you, bother, you uh, borrowed a bit from the Stoics. Hey, from a lot of people. Right. <laughs> and that's the, another thing with happiness. There's nothing secret about it. Yeah. There's nothing new. It's, it's really all been done. Okay. It's yeah. funny, Edwin, too, when you talk about being free to follow your dreams. I mean, it just occurred to me that liberty to do those types of things is, is a cause for a lot of people to be happy. And when they drop the walls in certain countries and people are able to come out and follow their dreams, maybe... Maybe liberty is a good uh, good thing for the list too. <laughs> yeah, no freedom. It, 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 it's like hell, you know. Freedom. I mean, I, I don't care. You you see, folks, they can make the whole money in the world, and they lose that part of that freedom. That money just like it doesn't exist. <laughs> it, it doesn't have any value. Well, one person who I think probably has reason to be grateful is uh, Peter Stavrianoukas. Did I say that right? Stavrianoukas. Not close. Uh, okay. Who uh, has a falcon and uh, is uh, is uh, involved in the in the ha in the uh, the hobby of falconry, which is uh, uh, I didn't know this, but it turns out to be a highly regulated hobby. Uh, and uh, he uh, ran into some some issues with uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife at both the state and the federal level. And he's probably grateful to the Pacific Legal Foundation for coming to his aid. Is that correct, John? Well, I'm. Uh, he's grateful. Uh, the organization he's part of is grateful. But I want to. I'm so pleased to see Edwin. I've known him for years, and when I saw his name on the guest list, I got a big smile on my face. So, <laughs> a, a wonderful way to be happy is to sit next to Edwin. I do a gratitude journal um, almost every day, and and after my heart attack two years ago, the first line changed. I try to do it in rhyme. And uh, the way I start my day is um, I'm grateful I wasn't found this morning lying still and cold in my bed. I'm grateful for all the laughs, loves, and lessons in this wonderful life I'm living in have led. And so um, second line's about my daughter, but, you know. Wow, um, that's beautiful. Gratitude. Yes. He'll, so, he'll, he'll uh, license it to you first. I, I will use it. <laughs> um, what, what happens is the, the sport of falconry, the, the bond between uh, people who, you know, they're, they're referred to as owning their birds, but, but the way they care for these birds and are focused on these birds and the, the hours they spend with them and, and the connection is, is I would say, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, as close as many uh, men and women have in their marriage. Um, they care... Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you asked um, falconers, would you risk your life to protect your bird, without a doubt, they would say yes. So they, they love these birds, and, and the connection between you know, um, the so-called bird brain and, and the human being is, is, is amazing to see. And the sport of falconry is one of the, one of the oldest sports, if not the oldest sport. Um, I can think of only one that's older. Okay, yeah. all right. And, and this is a hunting, sp never yeah. mind, because you're going to go there as well. Um, so the idea that, that these people would, would harm or hurt or, or mistreat these birds, especially with the, the literally thousands of hours they put into that relationship, is, is alien. Um, if I were to ask you what crime you'd committed if, if armed... Um, if armed agents showed up in flak vests and tactical gear and knocked on your door in the middle of the night and asked entry to your home, what would you think? Uh, well, Gestapo. Okay. I mean, what, what crime do you think you'd, you'd be guilty of? It would of? be a serious crime. Serious crime. Yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe, or, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, or, or a not uh, so serious crime, crime like having a couple of ounces. But. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, you're, you're a convicted felon and that's part of your parole? Well, 
the the agreement the the government has imposed upon and I say agreement with some air quotes which I hate is that sort of like a social contract yeah I with I the with falconers is that contract. if they uh, want to pursue the very legal spelled out in law legal sport of falconry they must um, be willing to be searched in their home anytime day or night unannounced this is for wanting to pursue the sport of falconry and, and, and uh, the origin of that kind of a uh, uh, um, who knows law? who knows okay. uh, it's uh, there are other other keepers and purveyors of, of, of animals uh, face the same kind of rules I don't know if they're as strict as they are on falconers and Peter Stavriandakis um, is an attorney and and he um, and I think accepted this for a while because he loved falconry so much. But then he decided to ask the um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, you know, I'm an attorney and I'm not a constitutional attorney, but I've read the Constitution and I've read everything I can get my hands on and, and nowhere in it does it spell out that I give up my rights to due process and, and their First Amendment rights, actually, because not only are they, they open to this unconstitutional search and seizure at any time. They are not allowed to uh, use their bird in any commercial enterprise whatsoever without permission of the fish and game. That's not, you know, hunting mice or something. That's having their picture taken unless it promotes the sport of falconry. That's videotaping them unless it promotes the uh, sport of falconry. So not only a due process, um, you know, all the, all the constitutional guarantees against illegal search and seizure. Um, but, you know, First Amendment forced speech uh, and not allowed to speak, um, all of these rules are being violated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And when the organization that Peter belonged to uh, said that, uh, you know, this is wrong and, and you need to change it or we're going to file a lawsuit, um, I don't remember who said it. it was the the head of one of these departments said go ahead We'll take your birds away. Wow We'll take your birds away so um, One of the uh, the uh, Peter uh, has a nice long biblical beard and he, he looked around for people who do constitutional law and went to uh, uh, went to Pacific Legal Foundation's website and looked at the attorneys and and uh, He saw a, a picture of uh, Tony <laughs> uh, with a big long biblical beard, and Tony looked at it, and Tony, being involved in, in uh, a whole bunch of cases, says, "Well, we'll send him to another beard, bearded warrior, um, uh, Mr. Snowball, Tim." And uh, they've been pursuing this case, and uh, we're going to fight for for the freedom of people to love the animals that they have this attachment to, and and we'll fight in a way that we. Uh, by we, I'm not an attorney. The attorneys at Pacific Legal Foundation fight uh, for freedom um, tooth and nail. They don't give up. They never, ever, ever give up. And they know constitutional law better than anybody else on the planet. So Peter should be uh, rightfully uh, grateful. For so is Pacific this a federal Legal case Foundation. or a state case? State and both? federal. State and? Okay. So yeah. that's why you've got two, two uh, plaintiffs or two uh, defendants. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. The part that I wasn't sure because I tried to look, a look into it What's the state or the federal motivation? What what is their end game? Well, I, and this I see. I don't understand this. If their if their aim is their kind of unstated aim or their stated aim, which is the safety and health and care of these birds, then the 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 health and safety of birds involved in the sport of falconry is degrees of magnitude better than the. 2,500 bald eagles that the uh, wind farm in Altamont Pass kills or has killed in the last 30 years. And the people who have this wind farm, because they're on the favored side of government regulatory agencies, um, don't fall under any of the laws that normal people fall under. They get to self-report on how many birds are killed. They violate the Migratory Bird Act and all the rest of that. So. Their, their stated goal of protecting these birds is, uh, I think their goal, it's, it's control, pure and simple. Mm -hmm. uh, it's full employment for thugs, pure and simple. Now that's a personal opinion. We would never say that um, as a... As a um, you wouldn't put that into your brief? 
wouldn't put that in the brief. Yeah. Um, wouldn't, uh, and I, I, again, make sure you understand all the thousands of people that are watching the show right now, that that's my per personal opinion. Because I can't figure out any other reason if their, their, their real reason was to make sure that these birds were safe and well cared for, they would want more people to engage in the sport of falconry, not less, and that they would hold people who run these bird choppers or tax farms, if you, well, I guess you can call them wind farms, but they're really tax farms, accountable for the, for the deaths of literally hundreds of thousands of raptors around the world on a yearly basis. Well, the, uh, the, world, the world is going to the birds, unfortunately, not to the falcons. Uh, and some people want to get off the world, including, uh, well, maybe Jeff Bezos. Uh, he wants to put one trillion people in space, and he's got a company that could possibly do it, Blue Origin. Uh, John, do you think that he's uh, got something going there that uh, is uh, uh, a, a pipe dream or uh, something that will happen in the next few, in the next few decades? Well, I, I think um, it, uh, private industry will certainly be more efficient at it than, than uh, government agencies. What um, Jeff Bezos wants to do, his motivation is a little bit different than, than you would think. He, he thinks that with a population of a trillion people in space, not necessarily on planets in space, but in space itself, that we wouldn't have one Mozart, uh, we wouldn't have one Einstein, we'd have thousands. And so, the, the, the number of geniuses out there that could lift humanity up to, to levels that we can't even imagine now um, would be increased. And it will only take one other Einstein, not a thousand, to really change the nature of understanding the universe. And he, he, um, the big barrier to being in space is something called the gravity well. It's enormously expensive, especially the way the government does it, to get a pound of cargo into orbit. Once you're in orbit, things are easy. Now, once you're in, let's say, on the moon, then you have access to raw materials and you have almost unlimited power through, through the intense solar radiation that falls on it. Um, once you're on the moon, you could construct uh, ships that could go to the asteroid belt and move asteroids and mine the minerals and materials uh, in the safety of, of uh, interplanetary or interstellar space. You could use uh, nuclear power that, that uh, people are so nervous about uh, on, on this planet, even though it's the safest form of power by far when you look at human death of any power on the planet. Um, and so once you fight through the gravity well, you can do all these things that he's talking about. But, you know, people that started like Facebook in a garage uh, or in their home, or in a dorm room, um, like Google, basically, the, the, the seeds were planted in a dorm room. There's no barrier to entry into that market. Jeff Bezos himself started his business uh, in his garage. But to, to get into outer space is, is a multi-million dollar proposition. So these geniuses that, that have been able to jumpstart businesses that have changed the world, I have an iPhone here with more computing power on it than Apollo 7 ever dreamed of right in my pocket. But um, there's literally uh, tens of millions or hundreds of millions barrier. You're an engineer. You know, gravity, there, you can't, um, I think maybe if our legislature uh, wanted to pass a, a law, since you know they can pass any law, why don't they suspend the law of gravity for a while and make things <laughs> easier for us all? So I think he's, uh, I don't know about a trillion people, but uh, you know, uh, thousands, millions, tens of millions, certainly, you know, and then, uh, then, then space doesn't become a cost, it becomes a profit. Now, the first thing that came to my mind, I'm like, if we manage to put a trillion people in the space and we trash it, like we trash the head, what's going to happen? <laughs> Well, we, we already do have a lot of space junk out there floating around as it is, so it's one of Without those that we people. have to, yes, it's just from, <laughs> from the satellites and other things that have been shot up there and are floating around that aren't working, so it's one of the things that our, our government currently worries about as it is out there. <laughs> but, uh, I felt something on my head. Don't they, don't they all eventually disintegrate uh, as they uh, Yeah, a lot fall, of them, they, they the eventually earth. fall through, but there's just a lot of pieces falling, or, or I mean, you know, floating around out there that high velocities relative to each other and and you have different countries shooting stuff up there so it's hard to you know map out all this. Well, let me let me I'm not that it's an argument but let me throw out a counter to what uh, Mr. Abir said. 
uh, if you have uh, access to unlimited power and um, unlimited raw materials other than you know oxygen, uh, almost all space ventures uh, aim for a closed cycle, like people who you know here try to recycle everything they can. But in in space, at least with foreseeable um, uh, technology, every ounce of material that you lift into space is so valuable that you'll want to care for it. You you don't want to throw things away. You want to repurpose them. Uh, human waste and sweat and all the rest of that are recycled and recirculated. Um, and science fiction authors have since the 50s talked about um, these kind of closed cycle, you know, small worlds really traveling in interstellar space, multi generational craft and colonies on the moon and all the rest of that. And now um, the, the technology exists, especially if it's not confined to the planet. Once you remove the confines of gravity from things, then you can you can build gossamer worlds that um, fulfill the needs of human beings. Not not these huge skyscrapers with uh, concrete and all its effects on the environment and the heat it produces and the cost to do it and all the rest of that. You can you're going to have your walls be this thick. Mm -hmm. So um, you know yeah yeah you could look at the downside of a, of a trillion uh, um, bags of uh, trash but then uh, I think um, if you have unlimited energy and and a thousand Einsteins um, helping you think it through I think that's a problem that can be solved Jason well you know there's there's uh, one other aspect to this story that's really great now, aside aside from two if we think about this uh, along the trash side of things also currently that's been managed by governments and we've gotten all this trash up there so, <laughs> so it hasn't been the private sector putting it all up there but the, the other issue, though, is that this is part of a uh, privatization of space. So this is part of trying well to make it cost effective. Mm -hmm. And so this competition of Jeff Bezos, this is going head to head with um, uh, the guy Elon. from Tesla. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a lot of other people, too, that are trying to find ways to, to make cost effective ventures of putting things out into space. And exactly what you were talking about, that getting stuff up there to um, decrease the cost of getting stuff up there so uh, yeah and I see the plus side too especially I mean with the way the population is just quadrupling here and no control they may be getting some folks to go out of space will help to minimize the population here yeah. and again the sci-fi authors have for years talked about that very thing yeah. take the pressure off off the earth and 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 you know, let, let people multiply. Yeah. yeah, but it's funny though, you think about how long we've been stagnant with our dreams of space with, with NASA and, and other, you know, uh, government entities out there. You know, we made it to the moon, was it 40, 60s. 50? Yeah, so 19, over 50 before, years 1969, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're coming up yeah. on a, the 50 year anniversary of wow. that, of our, of our first moon landing. Yeah, right? so I mean we've been we've been sending satellites out mm -hmm. exploring other planets and and rovers and such but but we've kind of kind of stagnated with uh, sending people up and so uh, you know this this effort of trying to privatize and bring the cost down that's that's Well, if noble you think effort. about it, it took a couple hundred years before between when the Vikings and Columbus and and and, and the early explorers discovered North America and when the Europeans finally decided to settle it in mass. And it was the uh, poverty, the relative poverty in Europe that drove people to get the heck out of Dodge and find a, a new world uh, more to their liking. And I, I suspect that some, something, a, a similar social dynamic will take place uh, in the not too distant future as far as uh, people wanting to you know, go to the next new world, which could be anywhere. I can create one. And, yeah, have make, to your own, one. make your yeah. own. Of course, uh, Jeff Bezos was a, is able to finance all of these uh, uh, dreams and hopes and so forth because he made a whole lot of money with Amazon. Uh, he saw having more adventures with Amazon. He uh, uh, held a big competition for a, an eastern or, or a, a second headquarters for Amazon, selected uh, a, a suburb of Washington, D.C. In, in northern Virginia and uh, a, uh, a, a, a ward in, in uh, New York City. Uh, so far, the uh, Virginia people have only done a mild pushback, but the people in New York 
raised such a stink that Amazon said, mm, on second thought, I don't think we're going to put up with this stuff. And they said, no, we're not going to New York. Jason, any thoughts on that? Sure, in a way. It doesn't sound like it was all the people of New York. It sounds like it was certain segments of the people of New York. There were a, apparently a lot of people who were pretty happy about them coming there, and then, and then uh, you know, they, they decided at some point that, uh, I, I guess it was mainly led by a push from um, Andrea or, or Casio or Cortez and a few others, uh, but uh, trying to say that why are we giving them these uh, tax cuts? Uh, that uh, I think it was $3 billion in tax cuts that was uh, Yeah, it was, it was tax credits for future yeah. taxes owed. It was, a, yeah. it was a reduction in taxes, it was sure. more or less. Sure, but I, you know, it's funny. I almost think about, you know, a, a broken watch being right twice a day. And, you know, I can't help but analogize this to sports stadiums. You know, when a, when a city puts up money and, and gives favors to, to allow a company to come there and, you know, a private company and, and run a sports team in a, in a Can you city. say Kings? Yes, <laughs> exactly. But uh, um, but but it's the analogy is pretty strong here with Amazon as well. Yeah. Well, the the difference though is yeah. the can you know the, a, a sports team doesn't add any new uh, economic value to a city. It That's just true. substitutes one form of entertainment for another. And, and these jobs are much better jobs. These jobs are, not only are they better yeah. jobs, other than the you know the five the the, the five on the court, sure. mm -hmm. but they're also uh, going to produce. Uh, a win-win situation in the world of commerce. Yes and no. This is the one thing that worries me. It's, it's probably a win for New York if they go there, but for the economy in general, when governments start distorting the entire market of promising you know, more and more stuff to bring a company to one place or another, more and more incentives to, to get one company a favor over another company, it, it certainly has to hurt the economy overall. It certainly has to be less efficient. Well, the, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, sure. the whole idea a of, crony of socialism cities, going on of cities uh, competing to uh, bring in uh, a, you know, the corny capitalist competition to get people to locate in their city, that's, that's it's problematical. And that's, of course, what uh, Alexandria uh, uh, AOC uh, focused on. But uh, in this particular case, I think uh, that New York made a pretty silly decision to, uh, to uh, back out at this point. Can I, I have a, something to say to that. But I'm sorry? I want to just add to that, that when we Very come quickly. back. Okay. Very quickly. I think the other side of it, other than the credit, is what is it going to do to the community? That's the whole NIMBY thing. I mean, for real, yeah, it the whole totally. The whole NIMBY thing. You know, when you look deal. at where they were going to locate it in New York, and the, I think it has the largest project Good point, in the whole Edwin. country. We're, we're out of time. Yeah. Thank you very <laughs> much for being on the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you. <laughs>